Don't judge a book by its cover is a popular English saying. But for Madagascar, you should be forgiven if you do. Through a bird's eye view of the island, it's tempting to be presumptuous and assume that the island has prominence within African society. As you can't fail to notice its size, shape, and most of all, how the island escorts the continent from sunrise to sunset through space. Yet you might be surprised how low-key the country is in almost everything else. For instance, most island nations as big as Madagascar are geopolitical heavyweights in their respective regions. I'm talking about countries like Britain, Cuba, Jamaica, Japan, Taiwan, and New Zealand. They're all island nations yet major regional players in their respective part of the world at the least, or globally at best. Madagascar, on the other hand, disappoints. I mean, it doesn't even have an average standing, especially because it's one of the largest island nations in the world. Madagascar is not a military, economic, political, or cultural giant. And according to the United Nations, it's right at the bottom group of the global rankings in development. But for optics, like much of Africa, it's perfect. Some of the most recognizable real estate that the African continent has. Madagascar's position, and everything that is natural about it, just fits in with the overall scenery from up high. But zoom into ground zero. Um, as I alluded to earlier, that's where the problems are. Let's start with the economy. Unsurprisingly, the country's income is mostly agrarian and resource-based. Madagascar is a vast territory in the Indian Ocean off the southern coast of Africa. This land of beliefs and mystery, the fifth largest island on Earth, offers a great diversity of landscapes and cultures. A trip to Madagascar is always spiced with adventure. There are very few roads off the central highlands to the northern forests and into the arid plains in the south. Discovering Madagascar means, above all, slowing down, adapting to island time. of the Vezo, Madagascar's great seafaring people, the nomads of the sea. The Vezo live all along the southwest coast of Madagascar, a region parched by the heat and regularly lashed by cyclones. Right from its early settlement, Sarodrano has turned its back away from the land and towards the sea. The village is located on a spit of sand that juts out into the Mozambique Channel. So the best way to get there is on foot or by the sea, which can sometimes be risky. The fishermen's outriggers are practically the only craft that dare venture across the coral reefs that ring the lagoon. Coming into this village is like landing on an island. This is Solodar's family clan, three generations living in peace and harmony. Even though they are gradually becoming more sedentary, the Vezo have remained nomads at heart, as Solodar's father, the patriarch of the family, has always been. It wasn't mere chance that brought us here. It's the will of the Creator, 
that led us to this land. Before we were truly nomads, when there were no fish, we'd travel a long ways to find them. We'd settle in other fishing villages. The sea always wins in the end. She is mighty. We, men, we come and go, but the sea, she never dies. When there's a shipwreck, well, the whole village heads out in the boats to help. The carpenter is a very important person in the village. The fishermen come from all the neighboring villages to have their boats repaired. Boats come in every day here for repairs. The lakas, the Vezo outrigger canoes, are surely identical to those used by their ancestors when they migrated here from Asia. The techniques used for constructing the lakas are a distillation of all these fishermen's sailing scents, the end product of an intuitive knowledge of the sea. The boat is the heart of the Vezo people. A Vezo without his canoe is simply not a Vezo. He's just a vagabond. We use it to travel, to hunt octopus, to earn our living. The canoe is to the Vezo what the car is to foreigners. The elegant gesture of the Vezo. In Malagasy, Vezo means simply one who paddles. They claim they are not an ethnic group or tribe. Being Vezo is a culture, a state of mind. It's a way of living from day to day, to the rhythm of the tides and the passing seasons. The sea is the only means of subsistence for these mariners of southern Madagascar. Parents teach their children to sail very young, whenever they have spare time. This is the heritage that gets passed on. When children know what they're doing, they're put out to sea alone in the boat. Me too. I'll teach my children everything I know about the sea. Because the sea is the Vezo's Bible. Solida has been fishing since he was six. To scare the fish and drive them into the nets, it's always the same age-old technique. When I come back to the village at noon, I decide then whether I'll go out again in the afternoon. It all depends on the morning's catch. If it's still no good in the afternoon, I'll go out again at night for shrimp. And that's what goes on in a fisherman's head. Sailing fishing, living on the water. In the end, Solida yielded to the call of his destiny. The Vezo don't do any farming. They don't raise cattle. They live from and for the sea. It's their most precious possession. They never work the land, but why not farm the sea? 
With funding from an NGO, Soledad and some other fishermen have set up a seaweed farm. They're hoping to sell their crop abroad to the cosmetics and food industries. When the plants are young, you have to take very special care of them every day. Check that there are no dead or broken branches. Because if you don't take care of them, the seaweed could die. And then if you get bad weather, they could be damaged from floating debris. We don't have television to check the weather forecast. Sometimes we listen to the radio when we can. Otherwise, we watch the wind and listen to the sea. This is the very beginning of an experiment that could mark a turning point in these people's lives. The seaweed shoots aren't mature yet, but if the project is a success, it will ensure them a steady source of income. There's nothing here. It's untouched land. And we love it. We feel at home here. And the sea is full of food. The Vezo are attached to this place. We're not allowed to sell it. It's our heritage for future generations, so that they too can benefit from this spot. We feel good here. It warms our heart. There are a lot of people in the village, and we're happy. The Vezo are a free people, a tightly knit group that help each other out. If nature doesn't have any nasty tricks in store for them, Soledad and the fishermen of Sarodrano may very well make a success of their project to farm the sea, their source of life, their sole riches. Highlands in the center of Madagascar is a region where life follows the rhythm of the rice harvests. This plant, originally from Asia, is the staple food and part of the common heritage of all the Malagasy. It's the symbol of life. Rice and rice paddies also have a sacred significance for many Malagasy. At the frontier of the central highlands is another region, a mountainous lands inhabited by spirits a land of peasants marked by the marriage of sky and granite. The Tsaranoro Valley is not all that far from civilization, yet it has long remained cut off, as if the world had forgotten this land where the mountains reach up into the skies. Next is the style of government. Although he is now an elected official, the current president came to power via a coup. He even had a swearing-in ceremony, which made a mockery of the country's whole election process. Journalists begin to gather outside a military compound when a rumor spreads that officers there are going to issue a statement condemning civilian deaths. That little stirring is soon squashed by senior commanders. I ask you to, to uh, get away from here, go down there, because we, no statement will be given to you. But in a side alley just off the base, we stumble across an animated group of soldiers and junior officers. We're chased off, but as the meeting gathers steam, they're no longer talking in whispers. I think they are saying something like strong. No more orders from the from our chief. Yeah. 
We don't want anything from, from the president anymore. It's a real rebellion. So they are rousing and they say, let's go now. So it looks like a coup. Looks like a coup. Within minutes of the meeting breaking up, two pickups loaded with soldiers roar off in the direction of the main military base in the city. We follow. But they're fully armed and uh, they're off on a mission of some sort. They might be going to another uh, military camp. Yeah. These two carloads of armed emissaries are either about to meet their death or, if they reach their destination unopposed, sow the seeds to bring down a government. Let me out. I'm uh, just getting out of here. The soldiers just got out, all armed themselves and took defensive positions. Everyone's running. No shots are fired at them, and after a brief standoff at the gates, they're allowed into the base, where it appears the message of their rebellion is well received. Are the chiefs of staff meeting here? Technically, the mutiny never spreads beyond this base, but from this moment on, the government of President Ravalo Manana is doomed. Just anyone, one uh, officer, ask if the chief of staff are meeting here. Ask if the chief Andriy Rajawelna remains in hiding, but his protest movement springs to life again under the leadership of his alternate Prime Minister, Munja Rondefa. The position of the broader army is still vague. The whole organisation now appears paralysed with indecision, but over the next few days it becomes clear that at least 50 soldiers are openly on side. That's enough for the entire alternate ministry to emerge from hiding. But now you're back. You've come back. We come yeah, back. Come back <laughs> and uh, now we, we are very confident. Roger Wellner's Minister for Education and his Minister for New Technology, no longer on the run, but driving through town with armed guards. Their claims to power no longer appear grandiose. Their titles no longer absurd. The, the God is with us. God's with you. Yeah. That is God is with us. It's very miraculous. Yeah. What a difference God and 50 guns can make. Presidential advisor Andri Ralijon appears to have vacated his office at the palace when I dropped by, but he's still taking calls and hoping for the best. I think, legally speaking, we still have uh, some questions. Uh, I do not believe that all the forces are really with those, are supporting those illegal acts. Yes. Um, so, uh, at this point, I don't know what to tell you. I, I just know that there are some options, but um, are you day that goes by, the options are getting slimmer. Over the next few days, the Minister for Defence suffers the ignominy of being locked in a military base until he agrees to resign. The crowd moves to seize the Ministry of Finance with police and army standing by. Other ministries and officers empty out as the wings of the government start to fall one by one. It's said that uh, the, the, the mob has, uh, has gone to the Prime Minister's uh, palace to, to take it over. Yeah. So we, we want to check because here there are lots of uh, uh, news uh, happening, so we are checking it uh, if it's really happening now. Uh, well, it seems that the rumour may indeed be true. I've just had a phone call from the uh, transitional or alternate uh, Prime Minister who tells me he's uh, heading with his people over to the Prime Minister's official office uh, right now. That can only mean uh, one thing. He's there to uh, take power. Uh, by force or by uh, other means. We'll soon find out. This is the palace, right? This is, this the, is the palace, Minister. yeah. This is the seat of power here, really, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. That's the Prime Minister Palace. No trouble from the army, then? No trouble from the army. Not anymore? Not anymore. <laughs> the army unit protecting the serving Prime Minister have stepped aside as Munja and his group of mutineers have swept into the palace. It's exactly a week since Munja went into hiding. 
The serving Prime Minister hands in his resignation and hands over the palace to Munja in a ceremony that is as brief as it is silent. Can I jump in? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The soldiers who have just let this takeover happen seem a little stunned. The handover may have been fast and simple, but it is totally complete. Four days ago, four days ago, I was uh, trying to find you. You were in hiding. Yeah. And uh, now you're Prime Minister. Yeah. Did you think it would be this quick? Well, I've already, uh, I've already foreseen it. <laughs> but did you think this week? Yeah. Yeah? His supporters may be happy, but Mundra and Defo is not celebrating yet. The standoff at the palace was the first direct confrontation between his troops and those still loyal to the president. His triumph could equally have been a bloodbath, and a counterattack could still lie on the road ahead. You seem quite uh, tense, quite anxious. Me? Yes. No. Yes. Uh, no, I'm. I'm thinking too much. Uh, well, uh, the, the the charge of the office, you know, and uh, well, you we are still in crisis, you know. Yes, it's not over yet. We are still in crisis, uh, so it's a handover of power in crisis. <laughs> The military are still saying that they're neutral. In essence, they won't attack the president, but it's clear they won't defend him either. That task falls to crowds of supporters who are gathering outside his home on the outskirts of town where the president has bunkered down. Some are here to defend and support Ravalo Manana. Others come to defend the position and the constitution from an illegal power grab. If this is Ravalo Manana's last line of defence, then bloodshed is inevitable. Either his or a crowd armed with little more than bravado. <laughs> Ravalo Manana hits the airwaves with a rare public address. His olive branch is too little, too late for Roger Wellner's alternate ministry, who are now out in force. And they're in no mood to be negotiating with Ravalo Manana now that they have him on the ropes. The church and the UN are pushing for peace talks, but the alternate finance minister bluntly states the position they're now in. There's no turning back now that promises have been made to the military. If there was ever any doubt that the opposition's plan was to totally seize power, there's none now. And it's a plan that is now openly condemned by many international ambassadors, to the surprise and annoyance of Munja Rondefo. They have never condemned any of the act of Mr. Mark Ravalumanana. These representatives being who, sir? The American Embassy, oh, yes. a European Union uh, representative here. I think the, uh, the international concern at least is uh, you're creating a lot of uh, trauma in this country uh, and it's not exactly democratic because you know, this president is mid-term. Mid yeah, it, it, it depends on how you view what is a turmoil. His troops is crushing down the people, chasing the people into the, 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 their houses and the, the students into their rooms. The international community has never condemned it. So what is this? Until now, the army have maintained they would not actively attack the president, holding to a technical stance that their actions were neither mutinous nor a coup. Those semantics are dropped today. 
The army is ready to go to the palace and um, take the other prisoner out. They're ready to go. They're ready to go because they couldn't stand up anymore. They couldn't bear waiting for, for a long time. Within minutes of this announcement, city streets start to be blocked off. And as I make my way towards the palace downtown, soldiers can be seen flitting in the shadows. That's the, uh, the president's office, is at the end of the street um, behind me, coincidentally. It's also where my hotel is. Uh, I've just come from the press conference where the army uh, officially announced they are now turning on the, uh, on the president. And they haven't said that to, uh, to date. Uh, true to their word, it's about 15 minutes later um, and the uh, soldiers are taking up position uh, here. It was down this street just the month before that Rajawalna's supporters ran to their death trying to storm the palace gates. Now Rajawalna has tanks at his disposal. It's unclear how the palace guard will respond this time. There's a lot of firing. I don't know if it's return fire or if it's firing into the building at the moment. This is the exact spot where uh, 30 people were gunned down here about a month ago. And it looks like uh, a vengeance is, uh, is being served today. Within 15 minutes, the palace has fallen. This is the uh, office I was in uh, just over a week ago, uh, watching the, uh, the video or the government's account of what happened on uh, February 7. Things have changed. Like presidents before him, the end of Ravalamana's reign is marked with soldiers' boots in the hallways and his portrait off the wall. A bit of brickwork and some scary blessings. And the palace is fit for its new king. With a bit of pomp, but not much ceremony, Rajawelna and his ministry swear themselves in. A few months ago, most of the world viewed Rajawelna as the successful leader of a movement for democratic change. With troops at his side and declaring that elections may not be held for another two years, that tag sits a little uneasily on his shoulders today. And then there's the controversy about his allegiances, as he also recently decided to become a citizen of France. The controversy is because dual citizenship is illegal in Madagascar. I mean, how can you explain a head of state openly flouting citizenship laws like this and expecting law and order to prevail? This issue could come back to haunt this administration as embittered governments in the future may declare every law or international agreement he entered into as unconstitutional. The president's decision on his nationality was probably influenced by the colonial history that France has with Madagascar. After some back and forth between Britain and France during their 19th century colonial expansion rivalry, the two powers decided to put Madagascar under French rule in the late 1800s. Although the native Madagascans, as with most of Africa at that time, put up a very determined but desperate resistance, France would ultimately have its way when it came to governing the island, maintaining its hold until the mid-20th century, eventually granting the country independence in 1960. Embarrassingly, though, since then, it's been an overall downward or stagnant journey in the standard of living for the average Madagascan. Let's give more insight on this. 
When it comes to industrializing, post-independence Madagascar has been met with limited areas of success. As a result, Madagascar citizens have had to shoulder much of the economic hardships emanating from many well-intended but uninspiring government policies. For example, a vanilla price boom has recently been peddled as a solution to the country's chronic poverty levels, but its potential as a viable economic model has yet to be determined. Economies like Madagascar's that are heavily based on commodities have a notorious reputation for booms and busts that are too spaced out and not sustainable in the long run. This sweeping landscape that stretches to the far mountains is not a continent, it's an island. At the dawn of geological time 150 million years ago, Gondwana, a supercontinent made up of Africa, America, and Antarctica began to break apart Madagascar separated from Africa and began to drift on the turquoise waters of the Indian Ocean. It was not until about 2,000 years ago that the first humans arrived. They were Indonesians, who had used the monsoon winds to sail their outrigger canoes all the way to the shores of Madagascar. Down through the centuries, the identity of the Malgash people took shape and would be enriched by the contributions of Arab and Indian navigators. Madagascar's pre-colonial history is very intriguing. No one can say with certainty how the predominantly mixed population of African and East Asian ancestry first settled on the island. A lot of historians believe that the first settlers came from around 350 BC to 550 AD using canoes from Asia, and were followed some 500 years later by Africans from the continent's east coast. Let's just use common sense and basic understanding of human nature to shortlist this theory, without trivializing the academic research already done. The Chinese have been trading on the east coast of Africa since the 9th century, and we can still see traces today that prove how advanced this ancient society was. You can easily demonstrate that they were capable of reaching distant shores at will. We don't know of a large African or Asian empire, like that of the Zulus or Mongols, that sailed and established themselves in Madagascar prior to the arrival of the Arabs or Europeans. If we did, it would easily explain this unique and grand-scale mixing of cultures on an isolated island. Yet it's undeniable that these two cultures had an ancient interaction, but how remains a mystery. Personally, I have my doubts about this generally accepted theory, as most civilizations with the ability to traverse something as huge as the Indian Ocean usually maintain evidence of that sophistication to the point of known history. Like the various Chinese expeditions to East Africa that I mentioned earlier, there has to be some historical advertisement suggesting what happened. For me, the close nature of pre-colonial Madagascar just doesn't fit this theory of a select group of Africans and Asians deliberately navigating the ocean on a one-way trip specifically to this island, on canoes, and no further. Let's be serious. That can't be the scientific explanation for why millions of Madagascans share Tiger Woods looks. Anyways, later on, the Arabs arrived together with the slave trade in the 9th century and were joined some 500 years later by the early Portuguese explorers, which led to the opening of borders, foreign trade, international diplomacy, and ultimately in colonization by the Europeans. Philibert Serenana was the man chosen to be the first president of independent Madagascar. The founding president of independent Madagascar started his term in 1960 and ended it, or rather, had it ended in 1972. His 12-year stint as the country's leader ended after civilian protests by the Madagascan people, known as the Rotaka. Their grievances included his mismanagement of the economy and his pro-Western stance with the former imperial master. France. After his deposing, the Madagascan government went through three rapid leadership changes until they settled on Didier Ratsaraka. Ratsaraka's rule brought instability, but liberties were severely curtailed. His luck would run out in 1993 with a global shift in the political world following the Soviet Union's collapse. This time, though, the Madagascan people allowed successive presidents to have longer stints in office. This tranquility would come to an abrupt end with the 2009 presidential elections which brought in President Andri Rajolina. However, not
perhaps also because any outside military disturbances would require a sustainable naval presence, which none of the mainland countries on the continent have. So its isolation from a continent has served as a buffer to any cross-border violence experienced by many Africans as a result of the liberation movements and civil wars of the 60s to the 90s. Madagascar's capital city, Antananarivo, also reflects the advantages and disadvantages of having marine borders. It's all about seclusion. Should there be a period of prosperity, then the authorities don't have to worry about outside interference such as illegal migration. Equally, should there be problems, then the citizens can't access relief as easily or escape to greener pastures due to the island's remoteness. Most of Madagascar's former administrations allowed this geographical isolation to barricade them from continental Africa's plants. However, there has been a revision of this position recently with senior Madagascan officials vying for continental influence, such as the recent campaign by Richard Randri Mandrado for the chairmanship of the African Union. This could be the start of a long-term campaign by Madagascans to fulfill their role as Africa's principal island nation, which in my opinion is currently held by Mauritius. Like Japan in the 18th century, Madagascar has a lot of headroom to maneuver and take advantage of. Its size and human capital can easily have the island becoming a major player in Africa politically, economically, culturally, and dare I say it, militarily, which will at last shed their sorry position globally among their fellow island states.